Um, I can remember when I was a kid, I was in Rochester, New York. It was third grade. Miss Tarkowski was our teacher. And Miss Tarkowski handed out a sheet, a white sheet of construction paper. And we were all supposed to come up with something to draw. Well, one of my friends shot his hand up and proclaimed he was done. I mean, the paper had just been handed out. She said, what have you done? He said, it's a polar bear in a snowstorm. <laughs> now, when you're in third grade, that seems kind of funny. And I, I see, I think Sarah and Rachel and Erica are here this morning. Good morning to y'all. But y'all might find that kind of funny. I also, looking back, realized that maybe when the lawyer in me started coming out. Because while I was laughing with the rest of the class, there's part of me that was thinking, well, no, that's not right. I'd like to challenge him because it should have two eyes and a mouth or a nose. But I didn't. What that picture lacked, if it were indeed a, a polar bear in a snowstorm, is it lacked contrast. There was nothing that made the polar bear stand out from the snowstorm. There was no contrast. Contrast is important. Contrast is what gives definition. It's what gives insight. It's what gives clarity. It's what gives meaning. So we need contrast, not just in electronics, but we need contrast not just in visuals, but sometimes we even need contrast in life and in lessons. There's a whole area of theology that is called uh, uh, negative theology. It's got a better, fancier name for it, but it's negative theology. And that whole area of theology says, in some ways, it's really hard to describe who God is. And it's easier sometimes to describe who He is not. So, for example, you can say, well, tell me what the Trinity is... But sometimes it's easier to tell you what the Trinity is not. God is not. You know, Jesus, when God on earth, the Holy Spirit after Jesus leaves, and God in heaven when he's not Jesus on earth. It's not that, yet there is a distinction, yet there are one. It's a negative thing. So contrast helps us, not only with things we see visually, but with things we're trying to understand and ideas. So within that frame of mind, we're going to talk about two areas of contrast in 1 Samuel. We're going to contrast two different families, and then we're going to contrast two different Sauls. Okay? That's the goal. But to do that, we got to tell the story a little bit first because you got to have the data for the contrast. So let's tell the stories. We'll throw it up on a timeline, first of all. The timeline, this is about 1000 BC, maybe a little bit later, but somewhere around 1000 or so BC. We have already had the period of the judges. In fact, this is right at the end of that time period of the judges. And it also includes the period of the monarchy, where you have the first king of Israel, Saul. So Samuel comes right in to that time frame and bleeds over into a little of both. Samuel is technically a judge, but Samuel oversees the instatement of the monarchy as well. So that's what we have. Let's look at Samuel. Let's understand the story. It starts with his father. Samuel's father was named... Okay, not Elk Man. Sorry, that's a mistake. Elkanah. So the picture needs to go. Elkanah was the father of Samuel. Now, Elkanah had two wives. His first wife was Hannah. Means gracious. Means charming. Do we have any Hannahs out there? Any Hannahs in your family? Anybody watch Hannah Montana? Okay. Supposed to be gracious and charming. Then had another wife whose name was Peninnah. And Peninnah was very prolific. She had like octuplets. 
Okay, well, maybe not octuplets, but she had a lot of children. In fact, some scholars believe Peninnah comes from the Hebrew word for, um, I'm trying to think of a polite way to say this, um, extremely reproductive. <laughs> it could also come from a Hebrew word that means pearl. I don't know why those two seem to be the same, but Peninnah and Hannah. Now, two wives... Hannah, the gracious one, has no children. She cannot bear children. Peninnah, the prolific one, she, she makes the octomom look like uh, just another lady. Okay, She's putting out the kids and rubbing it in Hannah's nose. We don't know how, but you can imagine, you know, the jokes. So, Elkanah, nice guy, devout man. Every year he goes with his family to sacrifice. Now, they live in Ephraim in the hill country. If you were here last week, we talked about the 200 to 350 settlements in the hill country that all came about at the time of the Israeli, or Israelite settlement. It's in those very hill country villages we looked at that Elkanah and his wives and the children by Peninnah lived. And every year they would go over to Shiloh to worship. Now Shiloh is where the, the ark, you know, after the Israelites had come out of Egypt, they set up the ark and they set up the tabernacle in Shiloh. So it was the place of worship at the time, special worship, going to hear the Lord. So every year, Elkanah would take his wives, take his children, and they would go, and he would parcel out a sacrifice so everybody could take the sacrifice up to the priest. The priests were supposed to sacrifice the animal. In essence, they throw it on the altar. In other words, they cook it. And they give the fat portion to the Lord. The priests take their share, and then they give the proper share to whomever is offering the sacrifice. It's kind of a bring your own barbecue thing with a bit of devotion involved. So they go every year. This is the family vacation. And every year Elkanah gets to do it with, I mean, uh, uh, Elkanah takes his both wives, but Peninnah gets to do it with her kids. And Hannah is just kind of the infertile one left out by herself. So Hannah, one year, falls on her knees and just starts weeping openly before the Lord, praying fervently for a son. And as, as Hannah is, is offering up this prayer, she's on her knees, her lips are moving, but you don't hear the words, you just hear the sobbing and see the crying. Now the priest, the high priest who's ministering over this is Eli. And Eli looks at her and basically thinks she's drunk. She's poured a little too much vino into her glass and into her stomach. And her response, having prayed this, O oh Lord of hosts, this is what she's really thinking. This is her prayer while he's thinking she's drunk. O oh Lord of hosts, if you will look on the affliction of your servant and remember me, and if you'll give to your servant a son, I will give the son to you all the days of his life. An incredible prayer. And while she's undergoing all of this emotional turmoil, he has the audacity to say, hey, worthless woman, what are you doing drunk? You should not be showing up drunk to worship the Lord. Her response to him was, no, Lord, I'm a woman. I'm troubled in spirit. I've been pouring out my soul before the Lord, not pouring out the wine into my soul. Do not regard your servant a worthless woman. Remember that phrase. Do not regard your servant a worthless woman. 
So he says, may God bless you on your prayers. Sorry, I thought you were drunk. That was my mistake. Uh, good luck. See you later. She leaves. She goes back home with uh, Elkanah. And lo and behold, God hears her prayer. She gets pregnant. Yes, it's a boy. She names him Samuel, which at least sounds like, and may even come from the Hebrew for, heard by God. And she says that. I'm naming him Samuel because I've been heard by God. God heard my prayer when I ask God for this son. Well, um, you know, she had promised the son back to God, right? So we know the story. Many of us know the story at least. Here's what happens the next year. Elkanah is going back up. Let's say she came back. Let's say she got pregnant and God honored that prayer within a month or two. Nine months before birth. That child is a newborn baby when the annual sacrifice comes around the next year. So Elkanah says, okay, Hannah, are you bringing babe back? And she says, not until he's weaned. I have a responsibility to take care of him. I'm going to take care of him until he's weaned. Now, we don't know how long that is, but there is a passage in, in it's in the Apocrypha. So that's a, a, a book that's written between the close of the Old Testament and the start of the New Testament. It's a book that gives some idea of where the Jewish mindset was and what the practice was. And it's got a passage in 2 Maccabees where a mom is talking to her son and, uh, you know, with David in the middle of this marriage and family and, and all lessons, uh, this is a good one. The mom says to the son, you're saying that to me? I bore you for nine months in my womb. I nursed you for three years till you were weaned. And you're saying that to me? Now, aside from what she's indignantly responding, scholars will look at that, and that's one of the passages they use to decide that typically culturally, children were breastfed for three years at that time period. So it would have been, let's say, Samuel becomes about three when he's taken by mom to the sacrifice. So maybe three years later. And it's kind of a dark picture, but it's a dark picture anyway because this is one of the Dutch master's paintings. Um, uh, uh, Eckhout uh, uh, Gerhand, uh, Gerbrand van der Heckhout, or whatever his name is, painted this. It's the infant boy, Samuel, brought to Eli. Because what happened three years later? Mom and dad return. She brings him, and she says to Eli, I'm the woman who was praying that you thought was drunk. God answered my prayer as you urged him to. I got the son I was asking for. And I told God that if he would give me a son, I would give him back to the Lord all the days of his life. Here he is. I love him immensely. You better take good care of him. And she left her son there to serve the Lord. Every year when she came to see him, the scripture tells us, that she'd bring him a robe she made herself. And, and the distance was probably only 20 miles. But when you're on foot, that's, that's a hike. And did she go see him at other times? We don't know. But we know that every year, she made it a point to show up with a gift, a robe, that she had made by hand. So she didn't give him out of frustration. She gave him out of love and devotion to the Lord. And the Lord responded to her. She had a bunch more kids after that. Daughters and sons both. So that's what happens. Now, she says, For this child I prayed, and the Lord granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have, I want you to look at these words, lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he is lent to the Lord. Kind of weird. We're going to come back to those words in a little bit, so hang on to them. There's another painting that Gerbrand van der Eckhout did of God honoring Hannah as Hannah cared for her son. And uh, 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 here it is. This is the same presentation. He was enamored with this idea, so he painted it twice, at least that we know. And I like this painting because you can't really see it. It's so dark. 
But right over there are two fellas. Let me see if I can. Yeah, I can't even see them much better that way. Okay, if you could see them, you'd realize those are two sons of Eli, the high priest. See, he had two sons that were ministering as priests. Their names were Phineas, which means brass mouth. And Hophni, the fighter. Actually, it means fists that hit. So he's the fighter. I mean, so he's got two kids. He names one kid brass mouth? And we're thinking, you know, we're thinking, oh, well, the name means that. No, no, no. In that language, that's the word. It's not like he named him Hophni. Well, if someone ever looks in the book, they'll find out it means brass mouth. Hof, I mean, fighter. Hophni is Hebrew for fighter. Phineas is Hebrew for brass mouth. I mean, so they just named him that. Oh, brass mouth. Oh, fighter. And you wonder why they grew up to be the rascals they were. And they were. They would, uh, the, way, the way it was set up, the priests, they're supposed to boil this meat for the sacrifices. And the priests, to get their share, there are special forks that they would stick in. By the way, when we get to archaeology, they found these incredible long forks that you would do with that at the digs in Shiloh. But that's another lesson. You, you take the fork and you stick it in and whatever part of the meat you got and you pulled out, that's what you got to eat. Well, the, the old brass mouth and the fighter, they weren't doing that. They weren't even boiling all the meat. They were taking the, the filet mignon, they were taking the choice cuts, and they were just grilling it. They'd even take the Lord's share and eat it. They were intimidating people if people questioned what they were doing. They had absolutely no regard for God, for His people, or for the worship that was supposed to be going on. And that's who they were. Now, if we go back, I need to tell you that a prophet, somebody with a word for the Lord, came to Eli. And he says to Eli, I need to tell you something. God is going to bring your house to ruin because of the behavior of your sons. Because of the behavior of your sons. And, and here's going to be a sign that your whole house is coming to ruin. Your sons are going to die on the same day. And Eli goes to his sons and he tries to say something. You know, why are you doing this to God? And their response is just kind of, hey, old man, get out of our hair. And they don't change their ways at all. Meanwhile, little boy Samuel is lying asleep at night. And we'll use the English painter Sir Joshua Reynolds painting of the calling of Samuel. Because he's lying in bed and he hears Samuel, Samuel, and he thinks it's Eli, the priest, calling him. So this little boy gets up and runs in. Yes, sir. Eli says, I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. Samuel, Samuel. Yes, sir. I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. Samuel, Samuel. Yes, sir. I didn't call you. Go back to sleep. Well, someone's calling me three times now. Well, it must be the Lord. So next time you hear Samuel, Samuel, just say, yes, Lord. What you got to say? Samuel, Samuel. Samuel says, yes, Lord. Your servant's listening. And God tells Samuel what he's going to do to Eli and Eli's sons in the house of Eli because of their unrighteousness. He says, and I'm going to bring a new prophet in, I'm going to bring a new priest in, and I'm going to make something new, and it's going to be right. And it's very apparent that God has something special planned for Samuel. The next morning, Samuel gets up. Now, <laughs> Eli calls Samuel in. This is an American painter, John Singleton Copley's painting of Samuel reading to Eli the judgments of God. Copley was the one who painted at the time of the revolution. He's painted a bunch of paintings of, of uh, John Hancock, of, of uh, signing. He's paintings that you'd recognize, Paul Revere. But he painted this as well. 
And I love this painting and I love this story because Eli calls in Samuel and says, okay, so what happened? Samuel says, well, I said, yes, Lord, and it was the Lord. Well, what did the Lord say? All right, now I put myself into these stories. So I'm sitting there thinking, well, I'm about to tell him, the Lord said your sons are slugs and he's going to ruin your family because y'all are not what you ought to be. How would I put that delicately? Oh, he just was talking about current events. Okay, no, not Samuel. With great integrity, he lays it out. Because Eli said, I want you to tell me, and I want you to tell me exactly what he said, and I want to hear exactly how he said it. And Eli says, uh, uh, Samuel says, okay. He said that your sons are rascals, that they're cheating him, they're cheating the people, they don't know who God is, that they are worthless, and as a result, he's going to uh, destroy them, kill them on the same day, and bring your whole family to ruins. Can I get your coffee? Well, before long, uh, the Philistines are at war with the Israelites. There's a big battle coming at Ebenezer. Here I raise my Ebenezer. There's a big battle coming at Ebenezer. And the Israelites are thinking, oh, our only chance of winning is by God magic. So get the ark and bring the God magic, the ark of the covenant, bring it down. And oh, get Eli and get his boys and get all the priests. This is what we've been feeding them for. Tell them to get in here and to do some God magic. So they all go there, and while the Philistines at first are concerned because they see the ark and they think of God magic, they quickly realize that God's not behind this. And on that day, Eli dies, and on that day, both the fighter and old Brassmouth die, and the Philistines take the ark. Now, I want to digress from the Samuel story for a minute and tell you that this turmoil, this is the judge's end of things. But as the Israelites are frustrated over this inability to handle the Philistines, they think the reason might be the Philistines have a king and the Israelites don't. So the Israelites are saying, give us a king. We want a monarchy. We know God's supposed to be our king, but we want one we can see. We want one that will actually march into battle with us and not send us carrying this gold thing. And so Samuel says, you know a king's not really all it's cracked up to be. As David would have said this morning, your expectations are not necessarily genuine. And so uh, uh, what, what happened? Well, uh, the people want a king, so Saul... Uh, is anointed by Samuel as king. And it's, it's an interesting process. And we'll get into it in more detail later. But Saul's a tall fella, head, uh, head taller than anybody else around. And he's from the Benjaminite clan. And Samuel anoints Saul king. And the first thing Saul does is he whips up on some, Philist, uh, on, on some enemies in a minor skirmish. And at that point, the Israelites love him. And, and yes, it's a great big homecoming. And he goes to Gilgal. And he had been told, when you get to Gilgal, wait seven days until I come. I'll uh, Samuel talking. Saul, wait seven days until I, Samuel, come to Gilgal. And then I'll offer a sacrifice to the Lord. And then you can go to battle. So Saul gets to Gilgal. He waits seven days. Samuel's not there yet. And the people start dispersing. And Saul thinks, well, I'm losing my crowd. So I better take matters into my own hands. The French painter James Tissot paints Saul sacrificing the oxen. And I love this painting because he just doesn't look all that great. I mean, that's, you know, he's kind of all beat up and dingy. I'm not saying that he looks horrible, but he, sac he looks like he just killed a couple of cows. And so he sacrifices the oxen, and right as he's through, up walks Samuel and says, What are you doing? I told you not to do that. God told you not to do that. You're the king. You're not the priest. You're not the prophet. You're the king. You're not the be all and end all. You're the king. And you won't be forever. And your house will not keep the kingship because of your disobedience and your corrupt heart. 
And as the story goes on, and we'll get into it in more detail when we look at David next week, but as the story goes on, Saul does eventually die. In fact, commits suicide uh, after a day of battle where he lost. Now, those are the basic facts that we need for us to now do our contrast. And I told you we want to contrast two families and we want to contrast two Saul's. Let's start with the contrast in families. One of the families is the family of Hannah. One of the families is the family of Eli. Now we're going to do this contrast, and as we do the contrast, I don't want you thinking, well, that's an interesting contrast that we looked at. I want you to see that the contrast is actually set up within the text itself. This is not... Whoa, at Champion Forest Baptist Church, we figured out this contrast. No. The whole point of the text is the contrast. One of the whole points. You see, the text is not written with one narrative about Hannah and her family and one narrative about Eli, even though by and large I told it that way. The text goes back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, bobbing and weaving uh, just juking and jiving back and forth because it's, it is, the text is wanting us. It's entreating us. It's begging us. It's saying, please see this contrast. So this is not something where we've got an idea and we go back and read it into the text. This is what the text is shouting out to us to see and to understand, to think about and to discuss. Let me show you. Hannah, she wants a son. Eli, he already has two. That frankly, he doesn't seem to care much for. Hannah offers her son up to serve the Lord. Eli is allowing his sons who don't even believe in God. To serve the Lord in an abusive fashion. They're into their religion for the money. Be wary. Oh, I, I've you've if you've heard me in class talk about some things, you may have heard this before. If so, hear it again. I am still stunned. Over 10 years later, from hearing a man on religious TV, Christian TV, say, all right, we're at the end of my show. It's time for money. The only way this show goes on the air and the only way I keep my lifestyle intact is by you sending money. So here's the address. I want you to send me money. Now listen, a lot of you have been sending me $10 and $20. That ain't worth my time opening the envelope. If that's all you got, just keep it. God doesn't want you to be chintzy. You need to be sending me at least $50 to $100 a piece. And the audacity. Or the guy who said, hey, I saw this on TV too. I, 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 I have friends in Europe who will not let their children watch American religious TV. And when asked why, said, because our kids can watch those other shows and they know right from wrong. But some of the stuff on Christian TV is evil, wicked, wrong, and it always carries the appearance of being right. And we don't want our kids confused. Now, there's wonderful stuff on Christian TV, don't get me wrong. But there's some stuff on there that will make your hair curl. The guys who get on there and say, hey, we need two $15 million private jets to fly around the country in because we're too important to go through the airport. Is just so send in your money now. It's be real careful about someone who's practicing their religion in a way that enriches them greatly. I'm not saying God can't bless. I'm not saying God can't bless profusely. 
Um, I'm just saying you got to know God. There's room for abuse as well. That's, is, is that making sense? I don't want to upset folks that are good, honest, serving the Lord, and, and he's blessed them, and they're trying to use that in his kingdom. That's fine. I'm talking about the people who are abusing religion to pad their pockets. And that's what these boys were doing. While Hannah's offering her son to the Lord, Eli's letting his sons use the Lord. Hannah was the one, remember? Oh, you're drunk. Lord, uh, 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 sir, please don't consider me a worthless woman. In the Hebrew, it reads real precise. It's a, 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 a bat because a, a bat is a daughter, a Belial, a bat of Belial, a daughter of Belial, a daughter of uselessness, a daughter who's good for nothing. She's saying, don't consider me, please, please, I am not a daughter of good for nothing. Did you know the exact same phrase is used of Eli's sons, except instead of daughter's it uses Ben, the word for son, Beni. And it says that they are sons of Belial. They were worthless because they did not know the Lord. So while Eli comes in and he judges Hannah for being worthless, useless, a good for nothing, an evil and wicked woman... He put that judgment on her wrongly when it's his own sons who are that way. And the irony should not be missed. Eli's sons did not know the Lord. And in that sense were worthless. Now, Eli's sons have an evil reputation. And the people know it. Eli knows it. The word of the Lord comes out on it. Meanwhile, Hannah's son has a great reputation. In fact, the passage says, Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. With Eli and with Hannah. Watch what happens. Eli gets a word from God about his sons through a prophet. But God talks directly to Samuel. Same message, but it doesn't come through a prophet. So that's the contrast between these. And it's given to us, and it's interwoven within the story so that we'll think about it, so that we'll chew on it, and obviously come back to it in a minute on Points for Home. But before we do it, let's look at the other contrast. I want to talk about the contrast in Saul's for a moment. Did you know that there are two Saul's in 1 Samuel. There are two Saul's in 1 Samuel. One of them is named Samuel. And one of them is named Saul. How is that so, you ask? Well, that's what the Elmo is for. Samuel and Saul. See, the word Saul in Hebrew, the word Saul means ask. So your, your Hebrew, Saul, is going to mean ask. Saul is the king the people got when they ask for a king. Fitting name. But it's the same word that Hannah uses over and over and over in her request to God for a son. And so we have it. I want to focus in on a couple of them in, uh, specifically. Uh, the, the first one that we'll focus on is in verse 17 of chapter 1. So we're in 1 Samuel chapter 1. Here's verse 17. Eli answered, Go in peace. And the God of Israel... Grant your petition that you have made to him. That you have made right there. See you have made. Time out. You have made. 
That, do you know what that word is? Saul. Grant your petition that you sawed to God. And in due time, verse 20, Hannah conceived, Hannah bore a son, she called his name Samuel because she said, I've asked for him from the Lord. The word ask, right there, I sawed for him. That's the word saw. In fact, Samuel, and a lot of Hebrew scholars have fun with this, in Hebrew, Samuel is four letters. Saul is three. Okay? The only difference, Samuel's name is Saul in Hebrew with an M added in the middle. In Hebrew spelling, it's the exact, it's Saul with an N, Samuel. So, we have it, oh, look at this one. This is a good one. Verse 27 of chapter 1. For this child I prayed, do it this way. For this child I prayed, and the Lord has granted me my petition that I made to him. Therefore, I have lent him to the Lord. As long as he lives, he's lent to the Lord, and he worshiped the Lord there. He being uh, Samuel. Okay. This word, I have lent him I have sawed him. I have asked him. It's as if God asked for him back. I asked him from God and I've asked him back to God. Because here it is again. He is sawed to the Lord. He is sawed to the Lord. So Saul as a, as a word is used over and over and over in this text. And it's used to compare Samuel to Saul. So what are the contrasts we get here? What are the contrasts between Saul and Samuel? Well, both of them are leaders of Israel. One of them is a leader chosen by God as part of God's process. The other is a leader chosen by Israel. Oh, yes, God was said, okay, you want one, you got one. But it's not what you think it's going to be. And so the, the, the process within this book, and, and it's fascinating in, in Hebrew, we think of this as a history book. But in the Hebrew canon, this is considered a book of the former prophets. This is actually a book of prophets in the Hebrew canon. Because the focus of this is not just on the history. The focus on this is a focus on Samuel. God's leader for God's purpose. And that's what it is. And you have a choice. You can follow God's leader for God's purpose. Or you can insist upon your own leadership your own way. And this contrast is set up so that we can see the difference between the leaders. And Saul, as a leader, tries to usurp. He tries to not just be king, he tries to be priest, he tries to be prophet. He sets his own agenda and marches to his own drum instead of listening to the Lord. Samuel, on the other hand, simply repeats what he's heard from God. And so this contrast is set up as well. Now we've got these two contrasts. I want to look at them. But I want to look at them in terms of the points for home. Samuel continued to grow both in stature and in favor in the Lord and also with man. Contrast that to Eli's sons who continued to grow fat off the land and the back of the people and the sacrifices of God. Because here's where it boils down to it. I've got five children that are mine and a ton more children that we've grown to love and claim because they, we've gotten to know them through our children. I don't know if you've got children or if you are a child, but you know some. You may have grandchildren. You may have nieces. You may have nephews. I want you to take a moment. And I want you to think 
of at least one child in your life that you care for. Get the name or names in your brain. Because I want us to pray for them. I want us to pray over them right now. And we're going to do it together. And I want you to commit to praying for them. This prayer. Let's pray together. Lord, as we each put into the, our mind the names of children in our lives. We gather together by the blood of Jesus Christ. And we humbly on our knees, at least spiritually on our knees, bow before you and pray that these children by name will grow both in stature and in favor. Lord, first with you. That as they grow physically, that their hearts will be hearts that pursue your heart. That their, their, their focus will be on you. That their desires will be your desires. And Lord, we also pray that they'll grow in stature and in favor with man. Not by man's agenda. But by people seeing you in them. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to urge you to continue to pray that. Don't just pray. Now, here's, here's the rub. Um, I've had the honor a few times of being a graduation speaker, commencement speaker. And I always give the same speech. So here's your college graduate speech or high school graduate, whichever one it is. High school's where I wrote the speech the first time. The first time I gave a commencement address, I, I, I got to give the one when we graduated from high school, but I didn't know what I was talking about then. And uh, I'm not sure I did this later time either, but the, the, uh, I just happened to give the address like right after my 20-year high school reunion. So it was fresh in my brain as I'm standing up speaking to these high school kids. And I told them, I said, look, don't let high school be your highest moment in life. I said, I've returned from my 20-year reunion, which I guess now is past, I'll be, next one will be 35-year reunion, but there are people who reached their highest and best use in high school. They peaked in 12th grade. And all they can do now is look back and say, oh, remember When? And I made a resolution then before the Lord, and I make it before you, and I urge you to make it with me, whether you're 2, 20, or 200 years old. Don't peak today. Grow more before the Lord. Don't ever lose your fastball. Get faster and faster. And faster. You can always get closer to God than you are today. Don't ever let it be said of you, yeah, he peaked January 30th, 2011. It was a fast slide from there. Now, physically, oh, I don't think I'll be in the shape I was in at an earlier time of my life. But spiritually, intellectually, I was talking about every Sunday morning, I talked to my son. See, I talked to my son. He's over in England. I said, what are you doing? He said, I'm finishing up my calculus problems. Please understand, our son's getting his doctorate in philosophy. He's not doing calculus because it has anything at all to do with his degree plan. He's doing it because he felt he was getting rusty. And he wants to learn more. And I said, son, when you finish your doctorate, of course, I'm thinking... <laughs> Not a lot of jobs out there. I said, have you considered going and getting more schooling? He said, Dad, my commitment is to always continue to learn, whether in school or not. I thought, yes. Becky had a good influence on him. <laughs> Pray that. But don't just pray it over others. Make a personal decision right now. You're going to learn something new this week. You're going to get closer to God this week. 
you're going to read more scripture than you would have read otherwise. That for some of us might be one verse, for some of us might be a chapter, for some of us more. But you're going to grow before the Lord. Next point for home. I'm taking too long on that one. Eli's sons did not know the Lord. That's the contrast. Samuel is growing in stature and in favor before the Lord and man. Eli's sons, they're worthless. They don't even know God. You better know God. Jesus said, this is eternal life, that they know. That they know. Knowing God. J.I. Packer book. Knowing God. That's eternal life. Now the word know doesn't just mean some intellectual concept. In Hebrew, the word know is an intimate know. It's the word used for Adam knew his wife, Eve, and she gave birth to a son. It's the word used for conjugal knowledge. They did not have a relationship with the Lord. Okay, I want one. I don't want to be worthless, a good for nothing, a son of evil. I want God's fruit and God's life to be in my life. I don't want this to be a show. I don't want this to be for money. I don't want to go to church so that I can increase my business. I want to be His and I want His fruit to grow in me. And if there's some goodness in my life... I want people to say God is working in spite of that boy. That Keith Green line, when I'm doing well, help me to never seek a crown, for my reward is giving glory to you. And that's the way I want to be, and I hope you want to be that way. And if you've got any doubts or questions, or if you've got hang-ups, or if you've got problems, I'll repeat what I told you earlier. Email me. It'll be confidential. You don't even have to sign it. I'm not smart enough to figure out who you are off your email address anyway. Unless it says Becky at MarkLanier.com. Then I know it's Becky. Email me your prayer requests. I would love to pray with you. Some people came up to me this morning before class. One lady came up to me and said, my 94-year-old, I believe, mother has got a growth on the side of her neck. They're going to do a biopsy. Could you pray? What an honor to get to pray to the Lord and pray for each other. It's, 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 It's real. Final point for home. Samuel, Saul, both of them Saul's. One, a Saul of God, and one, a Saul of the people. Samuel is someone who was asked for from God, sold from God, and sold back to God. Samuel was God's Saul, God's leader. King Saul was the people's Saul, the people's leader. Hard question. Whose agenda are you seeking in your life? These are hard questions. I don't just ask them of you. I ask them of me. I promise you. Whose agenda am I seeking with my life? Who am I really looking out for? Steve and I had a great conversation yesterday or Friday about just what's involved sometimes in forgiving people. And, 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 and it all boils down to this. Whose agenda am I living for? Mine or God's? Do I want to set up my own Saul, my own king, my own agenda? Or do I want to accept the Saul of the Lord and his agenda? Do I want to pray the Lord's Prayer? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
because it just flows out of my mouth? Or do I really want the will of God to be done on earth? Is it about his agenda or my agenda? Who's the Saul in my life? Who's the king? The world's king? My king that I want? Or the Lord's king of kings? That's the challenge. So I ask you to pray the Lord's Prayer today. Take, do it over lunch. And take a pause with everybody and say, hey, when we pray that, what does it really mean? Next week, we're going to talk about David. So read 1 Samuel, email me your three favorite things about David, and I'll see if I can put some of them in the lesson. Would you pray with me? Lord, I pray a prayer of blessing over everybody that's gathered together in your name today seeking your will. And I pray that we will know you more fully and let you transform our lives. Because we want to be your people. It's hard. It's tough. We're a selfish people. We're a prideful people. We're a people who, who want to stand up for ourselves and our rights at times. And yet, Lord, deep in our hearts, we know that, that we are your people. You are our king. And we are your children. And, Lord, we want to grow before you in favor. And we want to grow before you in stature. And we want that for our children. And we want that for our families. And we want that for our friends. And we want that for our loved ones. And we want that for our community of believers. So we pray that your Holy Spirit will come down. And we pray that we will see your kingdom come on earth. And that our agenda will mesh with your agenda. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.